record it. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about negation. So negation is something which is present in every language, I suppose. I mean, I don't know of any languages that don't have it. And it can be done in a number of interesting ways. And this is not by any means a um, coverage of all the different possible ways of doing negation, but it's, it's um, an example of some ways of looking at negation. So, <clears throat> as I said, every language that I know about has a method of expressing negation. And that expression is usually either at the level of the verb, that is, it is attached directly to the verb, or it is at the level of the clause. So it's a marker of the whole clause. And an example of what clausal negation might look like um, is something like a verb that means it is not the case that. And there are languages that have a verb that means it is not the case that. And so you would have a sentence like, I like, I like cold, dark days. And then you would, at the end of it, put the verb, it is not the case that. So literally, it is not the case that I like cold, dark days. In English, we say, I do not like cold, dark days. Fortunately, today here in Melbourne, Australia has not been dark, but it has been cold. I was sitting outside, temperature got up to 14, I think, but only to 14, but in the sun, it was nice. But um, now it's got a bit cool because it's getting on to late afternoon. So, <clears throat> You do have the possibility of marking negation at the clause level, but in English, at least, negation is done by a free word or a particle, as it could sometimes be called. And this is the case both in English and Malay, but there is a difference between the structure in those two languages. So in English, we say, I do not like cold, dark days. And actually the not, the negative, follows the, that part of the verb construction that marks for tense. So, I do not like cold, dark days. Um, Asifa does not like cold, dark days, and I'm sure you wouldn't if you were here at the moment. Um, <clears throat> that indicates that it is the part of the verb that is marked for tense and aspect. I did not like cold, dark days. It's not, and the not follows that part, the part of the verb that is marked for tense and aspect. I do not, she does not, we did not, and like cold dark days remains the same, doesn't change its form. In Malay, um, the negator comes in front of the verb. So they say something like, jawabantu tidak betul. Tidak betul means not correct. Okay, um, <clears throat> that answer is not correct. There's a different form in Malay, which is where they use bukan, and bukan is used when the predicate is a noun phrase. So bukan guru basar is not a headmaster, is not a big teacher. Guru, of course, is a word that you would all know because this is a word that comes from Indian or Indic languages into Malay. I mean, the word is guru also in um, many languages of India, meaning a teacher. So, bukan guru besar, not teacher big. Okay, the betul in example number two, tidak betul, this is an adjective, and because it's not a, a noun phrase or a preposition phrase, you use tidak, you don't use bukan. Okay, so there are different ways, different systems that different languages use for indicating and marking. Um, Oops, hold on. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. Accidentally pressed my. Oops. Accidentally pressed my um, mobile phone where I'm seeing that people are here, and of course it started playing the uh, lecture, but a minute earlier. Okay, so what you can see here is two languages where you have a free word or a particle marking negation. Now in English, um, <clears throat> we can, I will just sort of briefly mention uh, a slight digression, the idea of tag questions. So tag questions 
are interesting because you ask, you have a tag question which is positive if the main clause is negative, and you have a tag question which is negative if the main clause is positive. And the examples numbered here 36, they come from an old version of the um, of these slides where this was the 36th example or perhaps it's example 36 in the book that I got it from. Arthur is not happy. Arthur is not happy is a negative sentence and therefore the tag question that goes with it will be is he. Arthur is not happy is he. Whereas if it's a positive sentence Arthur is unhappy you have to have a negative tag isn't he. Now the thing that's significant here is that although the meaning of Arthur is unhappy is a negative meaning, the sentence is still positive because it does not have not. Okay, so Arthur is not happy and Arthur is unhappy are actually two slightly different meaningful elements. One, Arthur is not happy is a negative sentence. Arthur is unhappy is actually a positive sentence because if we replaced it with Arthur is happy, we would still put isn't he at the end of it. Okay, so the basic construction in English is this. The negator not follows the verb that is marked for tense and aspect. So in the first two examples on this page, I am going today is the affirmative sentence. I am not going today is the negative sentence. I am going today, I am not going today. You put the not after the, the part that is marked for tense and aspect. She is writing a novel, she is not writing a novel. Okay, so in these examples, um, the verb that is marked for tense and aspect is an auxiliary or like verb. It's an is or am form, a form of the be verb. And in English, actually, negation always is marked on an auxiliary or like verb. So if we take um, a, a sentence like they went to the market, we do not say, we do not negate it by, by saying they went not to the market. We negate it by saying they did not go to the market. Okay, so you create, you, you um, derive a form do did go from went and then you mark the negation after the part of the verb that is marked for tense and aspect, namely the did form. They did not go to the market. Or we do, we, the affirmative sentence, we eat fish, the equivalent negative sentence version, we do not eat fish. Okay, we don't say we eat not fish. Now, once upon a time in English, however, we did say that. And I had um, some examples from the Bible, but the language was a bit complex. And so I, I, I took them out. But here, this is a famous example that I remember from being quite young. I was probably aged about 10. And there was a TV series about King Henry VIII and his six wives. Um, and the fourth of those wives was Anne of Cleves, and she was from Germany, and she came across from Germany to England to marry him, and he decided to marry her on the basis of a portrait that was painted, and you can see the portrait here. Um, I think I have seen the original of this portrait, um, but he didn't meet her when he agreed to marry her, he agreed to marry her on the basis of this portrait. And the story goes that on New Year's Eve, 1539, she arrived at a stormy, windswept Rochester ca castle in Kent. The next day, in the true tradition of chivalry, chivalric tradition, Henry hastened to greet her in disguise. So he rode his horse out from London in disguise, pretending to be something else, but he did not like what he saw. As it says here, he was horrified with what he saw. I like her not. I like her not. And I remember that phrase, I like her not, from a um, long time ago and thinking, that's not the way we speak now. And notice that the not 
is not even after the verb, it's after the whole clause. It is not, I like not her, which would be not coming after the verb. And it is not the modern form, I do not like her, but the not is right at the end of the clause. I like her not. Okay, so this seems to be an example of the way that English negation was done um, long ago. The examples that you can find uh, probably in Shakespeare, though I haven't gone looking for them, but I guess you can, and certainly in what we call the King James or Authorised Bible from 1611, you will ha have things like, um, he liketh not, meaning does not like. But today in English, we have changed it. The not has to go after an auxiliary or light verb, either a do form or a be form. Okay, so what do other languages do? Well, some languages do negation by affixes. So here's some examples in Turkish where you say, Kitabu okudunuz, you read the book. This is a plural, so, um, and it's in the past tense. Um, <coughs> so the verb is formed by oku, read, du, past tense, nuz, you, plural. That means more than one of you. And the word for book is kitab. Now, kitab will be known to you all as the word for book. This is originally an Arabic word, which is spread all throughout Asia and North Africa. So it's from Arabic, it went into um, Turkish. Um, from Arabic, it also went into Persian. From Persian, it found its way into um, Hindustani, Hindi, Urdu, and from there across to Bengali and Assamese and the word kitab is everywhere. So, kitabu okudunus. If you put a ne negative in here, the negative comes immediately after the verb, comes after the verb before the past marker and before the person marker. This is a very different position from in English, where in English the, ne the, negation, the negation goes after the verb that is already marked for person and tense. But here it goes right next to the root of the verb. And because the form of the negative is ma, it changes the form of the past tense and the second person plural agreement marker, du nuz, become de nuz. And this is called vowel harmony. I'm happy to explain that and discuss that with people later. But because you have an ah there, the following suffixes are not du nus, they become du nus. That's what that I with the double dot is something I can er uh, sound. So how is negation formed in Turkish? It is formed by a suffix directly on the root of the verb. Okay, another example. So this is mashaung tangsa. And this is a one of the tangsa languages spoken um, I got this information from Wang Lung Mosang, who sometimes listens into these lectures. Wang Lung is living at Neotan village near Nampai in the Karsang area of Changlang district, right up there in the far east. And in Mashaung, there is a negative system that parallels the um, past system. So what you do, and we talked about this not last week, but at some point in the past, we talked about agreement markers. Um, <coughs> you have the verb. So, for example, um, ga means to go. Ga tauk. I went, because that's, that's the first person singular. Ga ti. We went. Ga to. You singular went. Ga te. You plural went. Ga tu. Um, he or she went. But the negative form is very similar to the past form, but you put M as you put an M in the first position uh, of the syllable rather than a T. So, ga mauk. Now, ga mauk means I did not go, but also means I am not going and can also mean I will not go. Because since the negative 
in Mashong is in the same paradigmatic system as the past tense, the negative does not mark tense itself. So the, the, the um, agreement system in Mashong essentially consists of the past, the future, the negative, and um, the various imperatives, the commands, they're all part of the same system. And so if you have a negative, you don't also have the past because they're part of the same system. So, I went or I am, sorry, I did not go, I am not going, I will not go. Um, I did not go, we did not go, we are not going, we will not go, etc. And notice that the third person form, which means both he or she or it did not go, which would be with the verb ga, meaning to go, would be ga mo. The third person form is the same as the second person singular form. So this is an example of the merging of two possibly originally separate categories in the agreement system into one. Other closely related tongues of varieties do not merge the second person singular and third person in the negative. Okay, so, and what we think occurred historically in these languages is that long ago, there, there were serial verbs. So, ga meaning to go, and then a verb which began with T that meant something like got to do, um, achieved doing, and then another one beginning with M meaning something like it is not the case. This second verb gradually eroded down to become a single consonant and now means something, and so meaning it is not the case, gradually eroded down to become a single consonant and combined with the agreement markers in the way that we see. And <clears throat> um, Wang Lung Mo Sang explained to me that you use the same form, ga mo whether it is now, nga matau ga mau, I am not going now, nga ina ga mau, I will not go tomorrow. You change the word from now to tomorrow, but you don't change the marking of the negative and um, nga mza, um, nga mza, nga mza, I think, nga mza ga mau to. I did not go yesterday. This do at the end is a confirmative marker, confirms that something is or isn't the case, but is also found in positive sentences, so it isn't part of the negation. The point is that the negative marker doesn't change regardless of whether it is going now, will go, or did not go. You can change the um, word meaning from now to tomorrow to yesterday, and that changes the tense, but the grammar does not mark tense in a negative sentence. Um, <clears throat> there are other varieties of tangsa, and I think that Rira or Ronrang um, Dip can tell us more about this, is one that is able to do that, where you can explicitly mark tense distinctions with the negative. You sort of have a double marking system, but not in this case. Um, just for your interest, this is a table showing the diverse markers and ways of showing negation in the different Tangsa varieties. So we have on the left hand side the names of all the varieties Ngaimong, Mushaung, Mungre, Chulim, Shetu, Lo Chang, Lungki, Kalak, Yangbangbang, also known as um, Ranse, Shangti, Gaklun, and Rira. And then you have how the negation is done. And most of them at the top show, and that funny looking backward sort of Z symbol, which is actually the Greek symbol sigma, is used to mark a, to indicate a verb root. So in the cases of Ngaimong, Mashaung, um, and Mungre, the person endings all have stop finals, Ks, Ts, and glottal stops. 
But in the case of Tolim Setu Lautang, they all have open markers. So in the case of Tolim, it's um, Mang, Mi, Mu, Ming, Mo, except in the third person. They all have open markers. Um, notice that in, um, that I mentioned before that there was a merger between the second person singular and the third person in Mashaung. That's also the case in Naimong and in Mungre, but in Mungre that is also merged with the first person singular. In Chulim and Shetu, there are five different forms for the five different persons. First person singular, first plural, second singular, second plural, and third person, etc. And the languages at the bottom part of this actually have the negative marker in front of the verb. So for example, in Rira, you put me in front of the verb and then an agreement marker afterwards. And Deep, if Deep is listening, and I think you are, will know that we had a discussion in the Rira village about whether that negative marker in front of the verb should be me with a second tone, which as, as I recall is a mid-tone, or me with a glottal stop. And one of the younger speakers was saying me with a glottal stop. But me is exactly what the Yangbanvang and Shangti speakers, whose languages are a little distant from Rira, but kind of related to it, do. So, and this diverse, diverse system of marking negation in the Tangsa languages has arisen probably in the last 500 years or so. Okay, now I'll change direction and tell you about some other languages. So this is some result of some recent work, not that recent anymore, that I've done on the Woiwurrung language. So this is a language that is spoke, that used to be spoken and is being slowly recovered um, by the tribal or indigenous or Aboriginal people here in Melbourne where I live. And I was just talking with some people immediately before speaking to you this afternoon about um, a future research project to do some more study of the historical res resources for this language because this language hasn't been spoken as a mother tongue for a long time. There were speakers who remembered some words in the 1960s and one of my colleagues recorded them, but we rely mostly on 19th century sources like this one. So here you have an extract from R.H. Matthews' notebook, and you can see it's a bit of a mess as to what is um, being said here. Um, I'm not proposing to actually go through this example now because this is just a, an example of what language looks like, but I did want to tell you about the negation. So, somewhat earlier than R.H. Matthews was much more linguistically sophisticated than, his, than the earlier people who wrote down information about the language. But what he tried to do was to write a sort of a sketch grammar, a very, very brief sketch grammar of as many languages of Southeastern Australia as he could. But John Green, who lived with Indigenous people a generation earlier, spent a lot of time with one tribe. And he wrote down sentences like, he is not my father, Ngabun Mayu Mamanik. Now what we've done here is in the bold type, I have made a regularized, we could say sort of phonemic spelling, but regular in the sense that each phoneme will be spelled in, in the same way each time it's written. And the word at the beginning, ngabun, meaning not, negative, mayu, meaning here, maman ik, father, mine. Now this is a really interesting thing about this language and a number of others in Australia. The word for father is mama or maman. The word for mother is papa or papa or papan, something like that, which is the exact opposite of the way that children refer to mama and papa in English. And of course, in Assamese, you also have mama as one of the relatives. So here in Australia, you get many languages that have mama and papa, meaning mother and father, 
but mama will be father and papa will be mother. Of course, the first, the, two of the easiest consonants for children to learn are m and p, which is why ma is often, ma or mama is often a word for mother or father and papa is often a word for the other. So you can see the negative is in this language at the front. But there's a really nice feature of this language that I wanted to mention. And I also wanted to take this example to tell you a bit of a story about how working out this language happens. So a second uh, word that um, Green wrote down was absent in mind. So absent minded, someone who goes around not seeming to be aware of the world around them. And he wrote down abanden nargit. You can see that in the, at the top line there in the italics, abanden nargit. Now we know from this language that there were very few, if any, words with initial vowels. That's something that you find in many languages. There's very few words with initial vowels in many of the Tangsa varieties. There's quite a lot of languages that don't have words with initial vowels. But what's happened here is that speakers like John Green couldn't hear the initial ng sound when people pronounced it. So for abunden is actually ngabun dan. The dan part at the end of it means first person singular past. I did, I didn't, I did at least, dan, I did. Nabun dan means then I did not. And then you put the verb nanga, meaning here, and then some kind of ending on the end, possibly pronounced a bit like it. I'm not completely clear what that means. But I wanted to talk you through why we think this analysis works. So remember that it's absent minded. And what he's done is he's had a dictionary, a word list in English that he's tried to collect with people. He abandons it actually after he gets up to words beginning with AD because it's too difficult. Great shame because it would have been terrific if he'd um, persisted, we would have had a lot more information about the language. So imagine he's asking, going to his indigenous consultant, perhaps a man called Simon Wonga, and asks him something like, how do we say absent in mind? And maybe Simon Wonga, resp Wonga responded that he wasn't sure what was meant. And then Green tries to describe a situation where perhaps something like absent in minds means there was some action, maybe some children fighting or some dogs fighting or something happening in the distance and you didn't notice it because your mind was somewhere else. How would you say that? And I can imagine Simon Wonga responding saying, ah, ngabundan ngarngit, I didn't hear it. So it doesn't mean absent-minded, it means literally, I didn't hear it. But Green interprets it as meaning absent-minded because he has to tell a story to get it. This is an example of how difficult elicitation of language can be if the person you're asking for the language information from doesn't have the same understanding of what you are asking as you do. So I think what happened here is that Green asked for something and he got something different. But the point that I want to make for today's discussion about negation is that this is a very different structure from either the Mashaung that we talked about or the Turkish that we talked about or the English that we talked about. Here, the negator is a full word it stands at the front of the sentence or the, of the clause and the person and tense marking gets attached to it, not to the verb. If we wanted to say, I heard it, I heard it, we'd say something like ngarnga, ngarnga dan. Ngarnga meaning here, dan meaning I did. First person singular past marker, ngarnga dan. But to say, I did not hear it, you shift, you put the negative marker, which is a separate word in the front, and you shift the tense and person marker onto that negative word. Now, I think that's really quite extraordinary how much diversity 
negation has even among um, four languages from very different parts of the world. We looked at English, Turkish, Mashang Tangsa, and the Woiwurrung language, Aboriginal language of Melbourne. And negation was done in four quite different ways. Okay, I am now going to stop the recording.